This life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away when I die. It's understandably why. A lot of people are out of work. A lot of people are worried about getting sick. A lot of people are worried about their future. And yet there are people who have joy in their life right now. That's because happiness depends upon what happens. One day we're up, one way we're down, all dependent on the circumstances in our life. But joy is more constant. It's a calm and quiet assurance based in a knowledge of God's love and His presence in our life and that He will be there with us no matter what. If you're looking for more joy in your life, you come to the right place. In the next four weeks, we're going to explore the little letter of Philippians, a letter by the Apostle Paul written to a church he started in Philippi 
that was written from a prison cell, and yet it's full of joy. Sixteen times in these four chapters, Paul mentions the words joy or rejoice. Fifty times he mentions Christ. Why? Because his joy was rooted in Christ, and so is ours. One definition I've heard I love is, joy is the flag that flies over the castle of the heart when the king is in residence there. Is the king in residence in your heart? Then you can find joy no matter what. So four weeks, four chapters, four pastors with four perspectives. And today, the pastor sharing our first chapter is our associate minister of youth and young adults, Scott Horner. So let's join him in Philippians chapter 1 and see how we can have joy no matter what. Hey, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whenever you are watching this. I'm excited to be with you guys. I'm excited to spend time uh, this morning, this Sunday, or, or really whenever you are digging into God's word with you. My name's Scott. I'm the associate pastor here. I work uh, primarily with the students and the young adults. And, but, but we have the opportunity today to, to dig into God's word. And as Mike mentioned, we are walking through a series in Philippians, and we are studying this book as it relates to uh, Paul addressing this church and then also for us in the world right now. There's something so good for us, and I hope that, that you would just enjoy this time that you would grab your Bible and that you would turn to Philippians chapter 1. That's where we're going to be today. And you would follow along uh, with me as we uh, just really explore this uh, letter to this church. See, um, Paul is writing to this church in Philippi, and, and many people believe that he's writing in 62 AD. He's in a Roman prison at this time, and he is dealing with house arrest, basically. He's, he's um, man, chained to a guard, and that guard kind of changes every four or six hours, and so he's got a, a captive audience, so to speak. But he's writing this letter basically to say thank you. He's saying thank you to the Philippian church for everything that they have given to him. See, they sent one of their uh, pastors, so to speak, uh, Epaphroditus, uh, to uh, bring him just encouragement, to bring him some material uh, man, satisfaction, because back then they didn't have uh, what we have in our prison system today. They didn't really care so much, and so you had to have people that actually looked out for you, and so he may have sent food, he may have sent supplies to just take care of Paul, and so Paul is so encouraged, and he's so thankful that he's really writing to this church to say, hey, thanks, and then to also let them know how this gentleman's doing. See, he had gotten sick along the way, and Paul just wants to fill them in on, on how he's doing. And so, man, this is the one letter where we see Paul addressing churches, but he, addressing this specific church without any real strong rebuke or any correction, but he's really just saying thank you, and he's wrapping it all up in, in, in Christ. See, when we talk about Philippians, we talk about joy a lot, and, and there's a good reason. Joy is mentioned about 19 times in this letter, and then rejoicing, but it's grounded in and structured so that it's surrounded and anchored to this poem that we're going to see next week in chapter 2. And that poem is all about Jesus Christ. Like, the name Jesus Christ appears over 40 times in this letter, and there's good reason, because Jesus Christ is our hope. He is what makes us secure, and it doesn't matter what else is going on around us, uh, that, that we have this hope in Christ is, is really where Paul is going to camp out, and we're going to see him move back and forth forth between uh, some different aspects of this chapter, or in this chapter, but then also in the chapters to come, where he's, he's always making mention of, of Christ. See, man, we live in, in this world right now where we're here, and there's not really anyone else here. There's a couple people here, uh, some staff members, and I'm blessed by you, but... Um, but really, I get to be with you uh, in your living room, or... Um, you're, you may be sitting on the couch. You may be still laying in bed. I don't, I don't really know where you are, but I, I do know that if you're in Christ, you're in a good place. So hopefully um, by now you are in Philippians. And so let's just dig into this together. So in Philippians chapter 1, 
starting off, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, Paul is saying, he's introducing himself as the servant. He's not making a play on his apostleship. He's saying, hey, we're in this together. I am a servant. The word is doulos in the Greek, and it means a bond slave. Like, he is committed. He is anchored. He is, he is bought by Christ, and he's with Christ forever. Like, there's no coming out of that. Paul's saying, I am anchored to him. And I love this. I love this part in verse 1. To all the saints in Christ Jesus. Man, to all the saints, you, if you are bought and you have, you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you are a saint. A saint means to be set apart or holy, and so if you are in Christ, you are set apart for God's glory. But here's what he says, in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. Man, if you're in Christ right now, it doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter if you're uh, at college. It doesn't matter if you're at home. It doesn't matter if you're, uh, this is probably grammatically incorrect, at Los Angeles or uh, across the country. Um, you're, you're protected and you're anchored and you're secure in Christ. I don't know if you guys remember third grade. Uh, for me, it was third grade. Maybe it was different for you in elementary school. But we had this project that we had to do. We had to do this project where we had to protect an egg. And we threw that egg off the top story of, of the school building. And I remember my project failed miserably because my little bag parachute that I had made with a grocery bag didn't deploy. I think my teacher just threw it down anyways. But, but you know, you, you, you try to protect that egg. And so it doesn't matter how high, uh, if it's in outer space and it's coming down uh, and, and it's falling to the ground at whatever speed, the goal is, is that that egg is protected because of what you're in. And if you are in Christ, you're, you can be confident. You can be confident. So it doesn't matter if you're struggling with uh, just illness right now. Maybe you had illness or, or something that you were wrestling with before all this came, came on. Maybe you've uh, been exposed or you know someone who's been exposed to the coronavirus and you're anxious about that. It doesn't matter if your uh, marriage, is, is there's tension there or if you're trapped at home with your kids and you're like, I don't know what to do with them. This is madness. Someone help me. It, what, what matters is that you are in Christ. And this is where Paul, I, I love this, this is the gospel in a nutshell. If you're in Christ, and you've received him as your Lord and Savior, then, then whatever else follows, man, we're golden. We're golden. See, I want to look at, uh, really, this is, the title of this message is called, The Gospel is Greater Than Circumstances. Because the gospel, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ coming, like we celebrated last week, Jesus Christ coming, living the life that you and I couldn't live, dying the death that you and I deserve, and raising from the grave is the hope that we profess. This is good news. This is something that, that we hold on to. And if you're there, then it doesn't matter what else is going on around you. I know. I know that may feel superficial because you might be going through a lot right now, but I can promise you that it is 100% true. It is 100% reliable, and Paul testifies to it in his life. Let's, let's follow along a little bit more. Verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Man, Paul is excited about this church. This church has, has started, you can read about when, when Paul started this church in Acts. Acts chapter 16. So if you want to, man, put your put that on like the little side of your Bible and write, I want to, I want to read when this church was was founded and, and who was there. Well, Paul meets this lady, Lydia, this rich woman who has basically tons of wealth, and he uh, shares the gospel with her, and she receives Christ and she brings Paul and his his friends to her home, and that's kind of where the first church in Philippi started. Now, Philippi was this place that was, man, a diehard Roman city. Like, they 
paid tribute. They were all about being Romans. And Paul is speaking to them, and they say, no, 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 there's a better kingdom that we're going to be a part of. And Lydia is one of the first people, this woman, this rich woman who sells purple goods, purple cloth. It meant she's, she's wealthy, and she receives Jesus. And then Paul goes on, and he, he, he's walking through the city, and there's this slave girl, this girl who is, man, she's into divination, and she is, she's owned by these people, and they exploit her, and, and God redeems her from her circumstance. And so, man, Paul is speaking to Lydia. He's speaking to that slave girl. And then Paul, because of that situation, they're thrown in jail. And, and jail, um, man, Paul is, is almost set free. The, the, the jail cell bursts open, and, and the guard comes in, and he's about to kill himself because he th assumes that all the prisoners have made a run for it. And back then, if your prisoners escaped, then you had to pay the penalty that they would have paid, which would have been death. And so, man, that jailer is about to kill himself. And Paul says, whoa, 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 we're still here. And so Paul is writing this letter to these people. And he's so excited about what he's seeing God do in their lives, like mentally. This is, man, so often we say things like this. Man, you're in my thoughts. Or you're in my thoughts and prayers. But if we just hang out with the, you're in my thoughts, it's kind of useless. Right? Like if I'm, if I'm standing there and I'm like, ah, oh, I'm just thinking about you, sitting on my couch right here, I'm thinking about you, it might feel good. Ah, oh, that's, that's nice. Scott's thinking about me. And it, it could bring sympathy and, and excitement that, oh, someone's thinking about you, but there's nothing going on that adds any value to you. And so all these things that we're going to read in the next little bit, man, move Paul to action, and that action is prayer. But Paul is thankful to God because of what he sees the gospel doing in the lives of these people. Man, in the life of this rich woman, in the life of this young woman who's coming out of, of human trafficking, in the, in the light of this jailer who's, who's had this rough and gruff background, and, and Paul is saying to them, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Guys, God is going to do and is doing a work in you right now. Now, in the midst of this self-quarantine, you might feel broken. You might feel anxious. You might feel like, I can't deal with these kids anymore. You might feel like, oh, my whole wealth and all this, my, I see my retirement dwindling before my very eyes. And God, is through this letter, is saying, hey, I'm going to work on your soul, and I'm going to see it through. It doesn't matter if you're incredibly wealthy and you're prone to arrogance. Maybe Lydia was prone to arrogance. Maybe she was prone to pride. Look at all these things. Look at all these people coming to my home, worshiping God. Look at what I started here. So maybe God, maybe Paul's reminding, hey, God's going to keep working on you, Lydia. He loves you. Or maybe you're, you're in bondage to sin, and maybe right now, during this time of self-quarantine, there are some sins that are creeping up on you that you thought you had put to bed. Maybe that computer screen is looking a little bit more tempting. Maybe your anger is flaring up at your spouse. I don't know what's going on, but man, Paul is saying here that God is going to see you through. Maybe you're gruff and gruff. Maybe you come from the military background and you relate to everybody with just that, that here we go mentality. Let's do this. And Paul is saying God's going to move in your life as well. And so Paul engages these people, thinking and reminding them about Christ. And then he moves on. It is right, verse 7, it is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. I love this. Paul, he moves from just thinking great things about them and, and thankful for all the things that he sees God doing in their lives to then how he feels about them. 
Man, he feels deeply about them because they're excited and they're moving in the gospel. This is what, how I feel about many of you guys. Probably, uh, I, I've heard so many awesome stories about what God is doing in the midst of this, this time that, that just fills me up. I just think, oh man, we are so blessed with an awesome church that is going out and caring for one another. That is, man, I, I heard this one story about this family that built a lemonade stand. And instead of selling lemonade, they have prayer requests and and so when their neighbors are walking by, they'll shout, hey, do you have any prayer requests? And some people will respond, some people won't. But I just think that's so awesome. And so, man, my heart is stirred for that. And, and here's what I love. He says, uh, I, how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. Now, that word, actually, that affection, I know this sounds a little crass. It's with the bowels of Christ Jesus. Now, think about that. Man, when you are, are stirred with affection, you're not just thinking with your head. And you feel something deep inside of you. When I was getting married and I was standing at that, that, that section in front of the, the pastor who was about to marry us, we got married outside and, and the, the venue didn't have any doors. So Carissa's father, my wife's father, he, he built these, these doors. So he, he took an old frame and he put these two doors and we had two friends who opened the doors. And when I saw Carissa uh, walk through those doors, I didn't just think, yes. This is my wife. No, I felt something deep inside of me. And this is how Christ feels about you. And Paul's saying, hey, I likewise feel with the same affection that Christ feels for you. If you're in Christ, man, Christ feels deeply for you. Where you are right now. That's huge. You're not alone. You're not forsaken. You're not uh, just in the corner waiting through this time. No, no, no. You have a God who, who sees you, who thinks about you, who loves you. And you have people who think about you and feel deeply about you. Your pastors and elders are some of them. In, in verse 9, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So Paul isn't just thinking great things about people. He's not just feeling deeply about people. Man, he is praying for people. And for you and I right now, what better thing could we really do for one another but to pray for one another, to pray deeply, excitedly that we would watch the gospel transform one another's lives? What better thing could we do? Because the power isn't in just thinking about someone. And the power is interceding. So you and I, we get to, because of Christ, we get to lift each other up and remind each other, or pray that the Holy Spirit would remind one another of the gospel, of the gospel. And this is what Paul ends on. He, he's praying. So you and I, we can pray. Pray for your pastors. Pray for your elders. Pray for your family. And he says he prays specifically for knowledge and discernment so that you may approve what is excellent. So James 1 says, man, ask for wisdom and God will give you wisdom. We ask and we pray that you would have knowledge and discernment, that you would not be led astray during this time, but that you would cling closely to Christ, that you would approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for Christ. Now that word pure is where we get the word sincere. And it, it means to be able to stand in the light to stand in the light. See, uh, remember, Philippi is this Roman diehard city. And so early Rome history, right, they didn't really care too much about art. They weren't about the fine things in life quite so yet. And so they destroyed a lot of fine art. Man, they would break statues. They would, they would shatter paintings or, or, man, whatever, mosaics. And so uh, what a deceitful or a dishonest vendor would do is they would take these things and they would, they would fix them with wax, and so they would smooth it all out. And so you, the unbeknownst purchaser, would walk around and be like, oh, that looks great. I want that in my garden. And so you would purchase it and you'd put it in your garden. And on the next hot day, you'd be walking through your garden. All of a sudden, all the arms are off. Because the wax would have melted in the hot sun. And so, man, Paul is saying, I want you to be sincere in your faith. I'm praying that you would be sincere and blameless for the day of Christ. That you're able to stand in the light. And guys, this is what I'm praying for you and for myself. 
that I would draw close to Christ, that I would be pure and blameless. Now, blameless doesn't mean that you're not gonna have disagreements, but it's that no one can say something about you that would be true. Like, that, that would be discrediting to your character. You're gonna have disagreements. Man, Christ talks about, Christ had disagreements. People didn't always get along with Christ and with Paul and with all these other apostles and disciples, but, man, they were blameless. And it's for the glory and praise of God. So, man, Right here, we see Paul starting off this letter, reminding the church that he is excited about what he knows and sees Jesus doing. Guys, God's doing a great thing right now in the midst of all this chaos. In the midst of, of man, maybe past sins creeping up, man, we can celebrate and delight in what God is doing. And we can pray earnestly for one another. I mean, so if you're not doing anything with this time, I encourage you to, to grow closer to your Lord and to pray deeply for your family, for your friends, for your neighbors. Guys, people are coming to Christ all over the place through this. I heard an article, or I, I, I read an article that was put out, I think it was through Harvest Church up in Riverside. We were, they said about 40,000 people have responded to receive Christ within the last couple of weeks. 40,000 people who before this were living and they thought everything was fine. But their world is shattering and they're recognizing, man, I'm placing my hope in a lot of things, but there's only one that we can really place our hope in. And so, man, he starts with prayer. And then he goes on to this. In verse 12, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Man, Paul saying, hey, you guys sent this nice care pack because you're like, oh, poor Paul. And he wants them to know. I want you to know that it's actually a good thing. Don't feel sorry for me. Be excited for the advancement of the gospel. See, Paul is single-minded on Christ and the hope that we have, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul's single-minded on that. And when you and I are single-minded on that, we can celebrate and we can see all these amazing things that are happening because Paul's in prison, he gets to interact with these imperial guards on a regular basis, and they don't, they, don't, they don't get to go anywhere. They're stuck with him. They're chained to him. And many of you guys are stuck right now. You're chained to your couch or the four-by-four four room or whatever you live in. And it feels small, but don't, don't be discouraged, guys. God is doing great things through that. He did great things through that in Paul's life, and he's going to and can and has done great things in your life, maybe already, and in people's lives through the midst of this time that we find ourselves in. And I am most, and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Guys, this is so exciting. Because of this situation, because our interaction is, is maybe once a week on a video screen or on your television, man, what you're finding is, is that enough for me? And I hope that you would say, no, I need more. I need more of Christ. And what happened here is, see, Paul's in prison. And so there's a, there's a void now. And, and what we see happening is that there's these other people who are stepping up to fill that void, and they're proclaiming Christ without fear. It'd be like, well, I don't need to say anything because, man, well, Paul's here, so he's going to do it. Man, it's kind of like pre-coronavirus. I, I don't really need to talk to my neighbor about Jesus because uh, maybe they'll hear about it on the radio. Uh, I'll just invite him to church, and, and maybe Scott or Mike or, or someone else will talk to them about Jesus. I, I'm not sufficient in that. You're all they got right now. You gotta be praying for them. You can text them. You can have a phone call with them. You can reach out and, 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 and speak boldly without fear. And that's what, that's what is happening. 
I was talking to a student, a student the other day who I would not have pegged for doing this at all. But man, throughout this time, he was just saying, yeah, I've really been encouraging my family to lean on Christ and to, and to consider God. And I was talking to some of my friends through social media and I was just saying, hey, you know what? God is good. And even in the midst of this time, like we got to lean on him. This is a student I would never expect that to come from. Shame on me, all glory and praise to God. That's huge, and that is what is happening in this situation where Paul is writing, and that is what is happening right now. And that's what I see happening, and I hope I see, I, I could hear stories coming out of this where fathers are leading their families, where mothers are leading their kids, where brothers and sisters are encouraging one another and speaking boldly of the hope that they have in Christ. And, and we know that that is happening, and I want to encourage you and say praise God for that happening in your family. And if it's not happening, well, man, one of you live, sitting in the living room right now, just do it. Be like, we're going to be about Jesus. I need to be reminded of that too. It's easy to get complacent. So just because Paul's in chains doesn't mean the gospel is. And the same is true for you and me. Just because we're stuck inside doesn't mean the gospel is. So God can use, man, that circumstance. He can use those chains. He can also use, verse 15, he can use your critics. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from good will. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. Paul is reminding them that it is only Jesus Christ who saves people, which is why it really doesn't matter who's the one saying it. And Paul's saying, look, there are some people who think that, man, because I'm in prison, oh, they get to make a name for themselves. Man, because Paul's gone, we need another big fish in this small pond. So someone's swaggering up and saying, oh, I'm going to fill those, those shoes. But that, that, that doesn't matter to Paul. He doesn't really care about that. All he cares about is that the gospel is being preached because it is only Jesus through the Holy Spirit that transforms lives. And it is only Jesus who makes dead people alive. And so because of that, man, Paul can say, I'm not even worried about this situation. I'm actually excited about this situation because I see God being glorified. And likewise, maybe this is more for, for pastors or for people that feel like, man, I just need people to hear me. Well, no, no, no. What, what people need to hear is Christ. Man, praise God that we have a church that really doesn't care. We have four different people uh, who are going to be sharing over the next couple weeks because we know that it's not about the person, it's about, it's about Christ. And so we're excited, and Paul's excited about that because it's only, only, only Jesus. So then... There's this famous section that we're going to read here. Verse 19. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and the joy and faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Man, in the midst of this circumstance, Paul doesn't really know what's going to happen. He, he's hopeful that he's going to get out of this, but even in the midst of that, he, he's saying, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Man, it is, it is a single-minded focus on Jesus and a desire to be in Jesus, to be with Christ in his entire life. And he knows that he's not going to be ashamed. And, and you see the, the dilemma that Paul's having? Man, he's saying, like, oh, man, I, I want to I be here, but, but if I'm going to be here, I want to live for Christ. And if I die, that's even better. 
because then I get to be with him in eternity. I get to gain something even in dying, but I know that if I'm gonna stay here, my life is going to push and focus and magnify the Savior. It's like a telescope. In this time right now, you may be at home and you may be discouraged, but you have an opportunity to be a, mag, a, a, a telescope and magnify Christ through your life. How you respond to these situations, how you respond to your family, how you respond to, to financial distress, how you respond to illness and fear and anxiety, how you respond to, to whatever situation or whatever thing is, is creeping up in your soul. If you hand those things over to Jesus, you get to magnify your Savior where your neighbors and your friends and your family get to see Christ a little bit closer because of how you are responding to that situation. And that's what Paul's saying. Hey, if I'm going to live here, I want to be a telescope. I want, I want people to see Christ more clearly and be glor- that he would receive the glory through my life. Man, ask the question, for me to live is... And to die is, for me to live is to gain material possession. And to die is to lose it all. For me to live is to gain power and influence. And to die is to hope that I have a legacy that will last for a little bit. For me to live is sports. And to die is, I don't know, not sports. See, in all those situations, if you're living for anything other than Christ, to die is always loss. It is only with living for Christ that there is gain. It gets better. Man, and that is what Paul is saying. To live in Christ is it better. And he says, my desire is to depart. And that would have been like the, the language that a Roman soldier would have been used to hearing. Hey, get ready, pack up your tent, here we go. And, and Paul, in, a, in another letter to the Corinthians, he says, man, this, this is like a tent. This body is like a tent. And Paul's saying, I'm about, I'm about ready, ready to pack up my tent. I'm about ready to, to go on. But I know that when I stay here, I mean, I have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus and that you, likewise, will get to see Christ through my life. And what a blessing. What a single-minded focus in the midst of this time. Man, that we get to, to magnify the Savior. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Verse 27, man, that your manner of life, the flavor of your life, the consistency of your life, the fabric of your life would be worthy of the gospel of Christ Jesus. In this time, please don't live parenthetically. Don't say like, oh man, I just need to get through this coronavirus time. Or I just need to get through this college time or this high school time or, or this uh, financial distress. And then once I get through this time, man, then I'll start whatever you're going to start. Don't live parenthetically. You only have one life. You know that, that what you're doing right now is a day that you'll never get back again. Are you going to make the most of it? Are you going to live in a manner or consistency of of the gospel, of what you and I claim to believe if you are a believer in Jesus Christ? That, That he did die for us. And he really is alive right now, and we really have a hope that yours and my manner of life would would echo that truth. Even in the midst of this coronavirus. In your home right now, are you just, are we just going to buckle through this? I just got to not lash out too badly and we'll make it through. Or are you growing, immersing yourself in the beauty of the gospel? Yours and my life would be consistent in that hope that we profess. And who you are when no one's watching now that we're not really allowed out and you're just stuck with your family or by yourself, like, what is your character like? Is it worthy of the gospel of Christ? 
so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And this is what Paul is saying. Hey, like, let your life as an individual and as a church be worthy of the manner of Christ and then unified and cooperative, glorifying God. And, and this is happening. We see this happening. We're with you as families individually, with churches globally that we're saying, look, it's about Christ. And the global church is responding. And that is what's so cool is that churches all over the place are encouraging people to stay connected. Churches are unifying. They're having moments of of worship and prayer. And that is a huge thing where, where God is glorified because it testifies like we're in this together. And our hope is in Christ that we're standing firm, unified, that the the devil wouldn't divide and conquer. It's not churches, hey, we're out for ourselves. No, 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 we're out for the gospel. Verse 28, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him but also suffer for his sake engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Guys, Paul's reminding them, hey, don't be frightened or discouraged by the opponents that, that, that say, hey, we are opposing you in Christ and, and we don't want to hear anything about that. That is a sure sign of their destruction but of your salvation. How many people do you know that would willingly put themselves uh, in, a, in, a, in a dangerous situation to profess the gospel or to do things for people that, man, are, are going to harm them? And that's a tough place to be. And Paul is saying that this is a, this is a testimony of your salvation and their, dis- their destruction. But don't be surprised when suffering comes. We can't be surprised when suffering comes. 2 Timothy 3.12 talks about suffering. John 16.33 talks about suffering. But here's the deal. Like what you and I are suffering right now is a little bit different than what this church was suffering. Or what, not what, what, what Paul is encouraging this church to be ready for. They're talking about persecution or opposition to the faith. But all suffering can be used to push us closer to Christ. And in this situation right now, I would hope that you would be pushed closer to Christ and that you would hang on like Paul is encouraging this church to, to live in a way that you can say, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. In the midst of this circumstance, in the midst of this situation, I know and believe that the gospel is better and transcends anything that the world has to throw at me. Guys, God is doing a work in so many families' lives. And that's so encouraging to hear as a pastor of this church. I want to encourage you to hold on to that same hope. That we could start, it doesn't really matter where you're at, but it matters if you're in Christ. And only the believer can look at this situation and say, man, I know for certain that it gets better. Because only the Christian knows how this story ends. And that Christ is the victor. And that God creates a new heaven and a new earth. And if you are not in Christ, man, you have an invitation right now to receive him as your Lord and Savior. To say, I know that I, I, I failed on so many marks and I've sinned or I've rebelled against this holy God and I have no business coming before him. And the only way that I get to come before him is because of what he himself did by sending his son to die as me, what we celebrated last week. And because of that, if you receive that gift, then you can be secure and confident, single-minded, focused on that gospel. And whatever circumstance comes your way, you don't need to be discouraged. And if you are already a believer, I want to encourage you to redeem the time that you have right now that you would be single-minded in your pursuit of watching God be glorified in your life. This whole thing anchors around a poem that we're going to see next week in chapter 2, where Christ is the perfect example of someone who does this perfectly. And Paul gets to be an example, and you and I, likewise, we get to be an example of reflecting that Savior. So would you and I, man, would we do that? I love you guys. 
I hope that you have a great rest of your afternoon or evening or wherever you are, but I hope that you are encouraged by this beautiful letter because that's the point. It's to encourage us and say, we have an awesome God. You guys pray with me. God, we thank you and we praise you. We thank you that we are able to be in you, Jesus. It doesn't matter where we're at. It doesn't matter where we're at physically, spiritually right now. What matters is if we choose to say, no, I want to be in you, Christ. And because of that, we can have a confidence and a hope to be people of prayer, lifting and interceding one and on one another's behalf, that we would pursue you, Jesus that we would watch you move in the midst of our lives, that we can be confident that no matter what the circumstance, that we have a hope that goes beyond this life. God, when, when suffering or persecution comes our way, that we would stand unified, that our lives would always reflect you. We praise you and we thank you for your incredible sacrifice through Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, I love you guys. I hope to see you, uh, or maybe not see you, but I hope, I hope to see you soon. Uh, but also just make sure you turn in next week. We have Pastor Basilio. He's going to be digging into chapter two with us and should be a great, great, great time. So love you guys. Have a great rest of your day. All right, God bless.
Será. Uh -huh. 